Fantasy Ed with Jonathan Chan, Kevin Quo, Richard Seville. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fantasy Edge. Uh, my name is Jonathan Chan. I'm joined, as always, by Richard Seville. Uh, this week, Kevin is off, so just be the uh, the two of us with our week four wrap up and week five preview. Richard, how are you? I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, didn't do so great in fantasy yesterday. I think only one guy on my F6P team scored a touchdown. One guy, and that was a guy not one of my regular starters at all. I <laughs> put in Austin Hooper, Austin Hooper, and he oh, scored. A, and he was the one that got a touchdown. He Jeez. scored a touchdown from Baker Mayfield. Yeah. So, so. If I'm not mistaken, Austin Hooper was your Jonu Smith replacement, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also uh, I had to sit out Jared Cook as well because he was out. Yeah. So. Well, at least you didn't start Brandon Cooks and Marvin Jones, who combined for one catch in nine yards. That was not good on my end. Oh boy. Oh, oh. so you, so is your fantasy, <laughs> so your fantasy weekend didn't go too good either, huh? Uh, I mean, if Valdez, Scantling, and uh, Julio combine for fewer than ten points, then I'll still beat AJ. That that's a thing. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Could well, happen. Well, he only had, I think, 68 points. But anyway. No, last week he had 68. <laughs> let's anyways. not bore everybody with our problems. <laughs> anyways, let's get into the news. Or, all right, Richard, do you want to start with the, I guess, the thing what dominated the headlines this past week with all the uh, the positive COVID tests? I just want to go to what happened during uh, during week four here. It's like uh, all the injuries and whatnot. I guess, I, I, yeah, let's get this COVID thing out of the way first. All right, so... As everybody knows, there was a lot going on in the news this week with Cam Newton uh, testing positive in addition to uh, more of the Titans testing positive for COVID-19. I think they're up to 19 players and staff now. So the Tennessee-Pittsburgh game was moved to week seven and the Patriots-Chiefs game was moved to tonight. And it's going on as we're recording this. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, about you know, canceling a week and letting everybody reset or just making everybody play a scheduled. Richard, what are your feelings on what the NFL as a league should do uh, before, I guess, we move on to how fantasy commissioners can kind of handle all the all the change? Well, they've got to make it a little bit more clear about what they're going to do about the, uh, the COVID from here on in. Um, because um, they actually, when I look at the schedule for this Tennessee and Pittsburgh game, they were actually lucky that it worked out the way it did. Because if um, Pittsburgh, if if it wasn't, if they couldn't have moved Baltimore, if it wasn't possible to move Baltimore, like if they were past a bye week or something like that, uh, they could have, they might have not have been able to get out of it. I think they've got to, I think they've got to loosen the rules just a little bit. I think they're, I think they're getting a little bit too tight about it. Like, but I understand the, the urgency and 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 that. But it's, I just don't think the the uh, the. I understand the fact that that you want to keep the public safe and public safety always must be first in mind. But these are young players; they're they're, they're not mingling with the older population or a player with a pre-existing condition. Um, you even saw the president of the United States; he's, he's seventy-four and he's hardly shows any real symptoms uh, like of the disease. Like it's not really a, it doesn't really that harm we know people of. that we know of. But but what I'm saying is that you know. Uh, but I, but I think that's a, I think that's the case for a lot of people though who 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 do get it and, and, and I've noticed and it's not just it's just not uh, not just um, notable figures that in the uh, you know in in of celebrity that are that are showing you know little serious condition but yeah, it's 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 mostly people who are so these are young players and I think there's a lot of, there's a chance that they can play through and I think it should be based on on symptom rather than just having it maybe I mean they got to loosen it just a little bit otherwise um, you're gonna have a week where nothing's going to happen I don't know how you feel about this but I mean it should be taken seriously don't get me wrong and you know mask up and do all the stuff but um don't i think just uh panicking i don't know if they were panicking that's that's a hard way to that's that's putting a hard thing on them but i, I just don't think they're i think it's it's easy to run away with this like a cool head prevails don't don't put everything into a don't put everything into a box and just say one rule for everything you know look at each case individually is kind of the way I, i'm thinking about it yeah i'm i'm on the other end of that i think because the rosters are so large 
And because there, there are so many different people interacting, not just the players, but coaches, stadium staff, you know, equipment people, people at the hotels, uh, airline, you know, transport, everything. There's so many people interacting with everybody around the team that if, you know, what's been happening, if somebody tests positive or whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, you can't, you can't go as normal. And you definitely shouldn't play like the players, regardless of the symptomatic, they shouldn't play through it. Uh, there's so many people around that this they become super spreaders to everybody around them if they're asymptomatic and they keep do and they keep going. Uh, look at the Titans; they've been following protocols, and what 20, 19 people have caught it. And you know the, these coaches aren't exactly young. Uh, no, most of them are true. you know fifty ish. So you know it's not just young, able bodied players. And it's like you said, the interest of public safety is the is the number one priority here. And absolutely, you know. These players shouldn't be playing through something that they can spread to their families. You know, I don't know about what the NFL is doing in terms of are home teams allowed to go home? Are they, you know, sequestered to a hotel when they're playing home games? But I'm assuming they get to they're seeing their families. And that's, you know, if there's any chance that they can be spreading to their families, they shouldn't be playing around with that at all. So any positive symptom needs to be bubbled. And honestly, the NFL's unless this whatever top secret plan that they've been touting for a while actually comes up with something they they look horribly unprepared for for a situation similar to the titans and steelers where they're just praying that bye weeks kind of line up so yeah that's right yeah exactly that i don't think they were uh, at all uh, prepared for it at all anyways uh i guess the fantasy side of this is a lot of commissioners have uh come out and said that they're like with like what joe did in our f6p league is if you have you know a possible postponed game going on like the titans or like the patriots and chiefs that you can leave that player in your lineup designate a backup and then that player you'd get that player's points if the game is postponed uh you know, post lineups locking. How? Are, what are your feelings on commissioners doing that uh, for for the rest of the season? I think it's a good thing, but it's a hell of a lot of hard work if you're in if you're a commissioner of uh, two or three leagues. Like I think Joe is. I think yes, Joe, he definitely is. And I think that should be a lot of work for him to keep track. And um, it, it's. I think you're pretty much bound to be on a on an honor system. You you could get arguments. You probably will get arguments, but. Um, but I think I think it's fair, and I think it's a good thing to do if you have the patience to do it. Um, yeah. The idea is to keep the league going as best you can. The main thing is to, that a commissioner has to inform the league or tell you know tell their people that of what they're doing. Um, it depends yeah. if you can uh, if you, yeah. I've been in a lot of leagues where guys just you know you don't they draft and then you don't hear from them again sort of thing and and they you know they're. <laughs> I don't know if you've been in leagues like that. People, I mean, most of the time people will, you can get a hold of them if they're, you know, especially early in the season before, you know, when they're out of the money, you might be, <laughs> but, you know, if they're out of the money by the, by the middle of the season, you might, they might be a little harder to contact. They might not care. But, um, yeah. So. I, I see a lot of pushback on, about this on Twitter is people saying that, oh, the postponed games are similar to, you know, Monday night questionable tags, but it's completely different where, with injuries and things like that, like for example, Devonte Adams and Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones for this yeah. week, you can follow their, you know, their progress in practice. You can see reports. You can, you know, get feelings from them and the coaches. But with testing, you don't know anything until it happens, and that's not something you can prepare for per se. It's, right. So it's a different situation, and I'm all for commissioners having that backup and you know letting the league be a little flexible in. Where you know half a half a day's slate can get canceled because of a positive test. So speaking of Ridley and uh, Julio, uh, I haven't been up on the news. What's their status for? Uh... They're both in. They're both in. Okay. They're both active. Okay. Good. Unfortunately for me, but uh, all right. Now that we're on to injuries, let's go on week four. Another couple running backs went down with serious injury. Um, we'll start with Austin Eckler. He suffered a uh, hamstring strain, I believe grade two hamstring strain. So he's going to be placed on injured reserve and he'll be out four to six weeks. Uh, Joshua Kelly has been the main backup so far. Uh, but Richard, what are your feelings on Justin Jackson moving forward? Well, he also, he, he obviously moves into the regular lineup of things. I think Kelly has to be kind of a little, a little bit more of the pass catching guy. And whereas, uh, I think they just basically, uh, move into the roles of the guys who, uh, uh, of the guy who's not there. So Kelly becomes Eckler in effect and Justin Jackson becomes Kelly. So I think, I think that's basically how they'll, they'll roll it. But you, you just never know with these things. Um, 
uh, it could go a hot hand. Um, uh, and Justin Jackson's not a bad uh, running back. And so I think you got to own Jackson, obviously, because of that. But uh, on the whole, I do think it becomes Kelly's backfield for the next uh, several games. Yeah, like you mentioned, Justin Jackson, uh, not a bad player over his three or two plus years now. This is third year. He's averaging 4.8 yards a carry. And I guess in a scrambled game plan this past week, uh, Kelly had 57% of the snaps while... Uh, Jack Jackson played on 40% of the snaps, so it's not a big of a disparity as people might think getting started. So I think, like you said, um, that, could that change, might split yeah. the work a little bit. It maybe becomes a 60, 40, 55, 45 kind of thing. I don't think Kelly takes it over outright, uh, no. unless he really, really shows something, uh, next week. Although he hasn't been playing badly. Don't, don't get me wrong. But. Yeah. I wouldn't keep his, have they got, have they got anybody else that's kind of a scat back on their, in their backfield? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't believe anybody experienced this back there. Right. Um, but I think it's mostly going to be Kelly and Jackson. Right. Uh, they, a little bit of a hit for Justin Herbert, who's been playing super well, but. Yeah, yeah, he can throw it deep again. Uh, who do they mix in on RPOs with, like uh, the receivers? Uh, does I, does uh, does Keenan Allen? Does he do any of that stuff? Uh, I know Keenan Allen has been doing nothing but catching. <laughs> um, yeah. I think Her- Herbert had him on thirty nine percent of the targets, or something insane like that, uh, over the last couple of weeks. So. He nah, was getting plenty of targets. No, nah, but you know what I mean, like what Lam- yeah. Lazard was doing, like before. Oh, he was another guy that. Uh... Oh yeah, Lazard's out as well. Yeah. But that's trying to predict Packers receivers beyond Devonte Adams is futile, <laughs> and it has been for years. Uh, anyways, next running back to get hurt, uh, Nick Chubb. He was placed on IR as well with an MCL uh, injury. He'll miss uh, the next six weeks, as reported by Adam Schefter earlier today. Um, well, the return of Belkal Kareem Hunt is is, uh, is upon us. And boy, did he look good playing on limited snaps on Sunday. 11 carries, uh, 71 yards, two touchdowns. Or 77 yards, excuse me. Uh, two touchdowns. Yeah. Uh, people were a little bit worried about his carries. He only had 11, but he was limited with a groin injury all through practice. And he's got to be a top five, a top five running back oh, for yeah. the next six weeks. Um, considering how heavy, how run heavy the Browns have been, don't you think? Well, they were, they were in effect 1A and 1B. So now obviously, you know, uh, Cream Hunt becomes the 1AAA. <laughs> and I, I know, uh, probably going to be talking about the, uh, the other back up there and he's definitely worth a pickup but the i, I really think that uh, um the the backup to, uh, we're going to be talking about Dearness Johnson right yes. and i don't think uh, you know how we were talking about Eckler and and Justin Jackson i would not pardon me uh, uh Joshua Kelly and uh, Justin Jackson i think that's the the split divide is a lot wider oh yes Kareem Hunt. Kareem Hunt is getting 80% of these touches easily yeah the only reason Johnson got 13 carries this week was because Hunt was, you know, nursing nursing a little bit of an injury, so they didn't want to overdo it. Yeah, so he'll play a really vol- he, He's got to be picked up, though. Just to yes, say he it. does. He does need to be added. Yeah. I don't think the Browns will completely go away from the run, or they'll try to maintain what they can with the run, just because I don't think they want to put the ball in the hands of Baker as much as they did last season. Uh, he's been pretty good this year. Um, but they've limited his opportunities. Uh, yesterday, they had Jarvis Landry throw a touchdown to Old Beckham, and then handed it off to Old Beckham for another touchdown. So they're uh, they're getting creative, trying to trying to mix it up and not putting too much on Baker at the moment. Right? Yeah. They. Uh, uh, go ahead. No, I was just uh, saying that was fantastic play. The the Jarvis Landry pass. He oh just, yeah. He just simple. let loose and just let that, that <laughs> thing fly, and it was just like, wow, this is gonna work, yeah. <laughs> and it did. Absolutely pinpoint. Um. All right, let's move on to uh, a season end injury this time. Uh, Bucks tight end OJ Howard tore his Achilles, so he'll be out for the remainder of the season. Just another uh, injury for Tampa Bay's receiving core. Didn't hurt Tom Brady, though. Uh, he still threw five touchdowns on Sunday. But is with it Gronk Howard season? hurt, <laughs> is it really Gronk season? He only had one target, and it was late in yesterday's game. I, I don't, don't think... know. I don't know. It's I... Scotty Miller time. <laughs> He's a little guy. Well, no, actually, he's a. He's, uh, <laughs> well, I think Littler. Evans still played through his ankle injury. Godwin should be back this week with his hamstring issue, so he'll have most of his weapons back and uh, and another guy that we'll talk about during our waiver section. But I don't think you can trust Gronk until he no, actually you shows. No, you can't trust Gronk. You can trust Braid, no. maybe. Uh, Braid is streamable, but would I stream Gronk? Mm-hmm. It just didn't seem Gronk's. 
Gronk's just like no. there's like a, a, you know just wallflower. He's a blocker. He's block. He's just he's just there. He's still an elite be, blocker, which is awesome. But I don't Brady think he's got the legs to under him to. To, to receive anymore. Yeah. Just he's there for moral support, Brady. When Brady has a bad game. <laughs> Brady will never have a bad game again. He threw a pick six in this game, but it was not a bad game. <laughs> did you see? Did you see how uh, like there was a bit of Schadenfreude, as they say, when uh, Brady threw that pick six and Justin Herbert's like jumping around, like smiling on the on the side on the other side. Nah, I mean a lot of people were making fun of Brady after the pick six, saying he was washed and oh, it's like Jameis never left and. You know, then he threw five straight touchdowns. Whatever. You know, that's just Tom Brady things. Yeah. All right. Uh, back to the Patriots' new quarterback. Uh, in case you haven't heard, we talked about a little bit at the start of the show. Cam Newton tested positive for the coronavirus and is week to week based on his symptoms and testing po- uh, testing negative at some point. Um, what does this do to the Patriots' skill players? Obviously, Julian Edelman and Kill Harry get a bit of a downgrade, but... Yeah. With Brian Hoyer early in this game, they're going run early and often. Does it really help anybody, though, now that Damian Harris is back in there and it's a, a three-man backfield once again, four-man even, when Sony Michelle... Oh, no, he's on IR, so three weeks. Uh, yeah, Sony Michelle on IR, by the way, but uh, out th- at least three weeks. I don't think anybody's going to be too upset about that one, realistically. No. But again, three-man backfield, um, Harris, Burkhead, and James White, who's back, and J.J. Taylor, who's looking pretty good. Um Again, Richard, there's no one you can choose in this backfield, but if you had no. to pick one to start at flex, who's the guy? Uh, I, it's, I, I guess it's really hard to say. But first of all, wow, on this Cam Newton uh, uh, news, it's I, it, it looked like uh, for, for all the money that uh, Cam Newton was going to be uh, really taking the making the Patriots look a little bit exciting. Like after after Brady left, it kind of kind of uplifts the hearts of the Patriots fans. Like, oh, good, this is this isn't this isn't too bad. Things are going okay, even though Brady's gone. Well, it gives a bit of sadness, you know, because to see Brady go and then Cam Newton comes in. Oh, this is we can live with this, and then and then this happens and forth. But I asked your question about the backfield. Oh man, it is so tough because well, we saw what Burkhead did last week and. I don't know how the I don't know how the uh, running game is going so far in this game. I think you've been able to take a peek in this game. Is it more? Yep, low? I have it up on the TV now. Uh, it's been all Damian Harris. Uh, there's been eight running back carries. Uh, Harris has six for 25 yards. Burkett has one, and Isaiah Zuber has one uh, for eight yards as well. Uh, White has one reception for 13 yards. So right now it's looking like uh, Harris is going to be the guy. Yeah, so he's obviously the guy you can well, need to own. But with eleven uh, fifty left in the second quarter, it looks like Harris is going to be the guy. So you never know how they'll end up, you know, in the beginning of the third. But right now, it looks like Harris is going to be the guy. Okay. Uh, well, I, uh, you really can't. I think it's 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 really as you were with the the Patriots backfield. You cannot start anybody with any real true confidence. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, on to another AFC East quarterback, Sam Darnold. Uh, AC joint sprain in his shoulder. Uh, he's gonna miss Week Five. Joe Flacco comes in. Now the Jets were unstartable with Darnold. Is there any reason to start Jamison Crowder this week? He's the only startable Jet now. Do you still play him with Flacco out there? No. No, <laughs> you can't. This is. Th- this is this has actually made a bad situation go from bad to worse. And well, we saw we saw what Flacco, what kind of quarterback Flacco was it like with the Broncos, and of course with the Ravens. And and it's I don't like to say game manager. Kevin would kill me if I call Flacco a game manager quarterback. But oh, I can play the role of Kevin here. Joe Flacco is elite. That's a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Elite <laughs> Joe Flacco. There we go. Kevin. There, there. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> but he would kill you if I if I called him a game manager. I did that once, and he jumped on me. But uh, uh but it is what it is. I mean, like. There's really no, there's really no trust. Career, what? Following all the injuries, game manager might be uh, an adept uh, yeah. descriptor. But he's not going to get out there, and I think they're going to have to rely on the running game if possible. I don't know when Lev Belgiver gets back, and it's, it's really, really, it was so bad that 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 Thursday night game. I mean, I only saw the the ending of it because I, I I thought, well, should I check into the game? Should I not? Should I watch? Should I do? Well, I better check in just in case there's something interesting to look at, and and there wasn't. <laughs> so 
Um, I hate to say this is a who, who cares injury because every injury matters, and I wish the best for Sam Darnold and everything, all of that stuff. But for fantasy, it's really an unimportant injury. Uh, I guess it has a little bit of importance for people, for the pass catchers. Like, I know uh, uh, Braxton Berrios is emerging, but how can he emerge with somebody like you know, Joe Flacco? I don't really see it. And- Braxton Berrios put up a nice big goose egg on Thursday, so... And I was with Darnold playing. Oh, well, so there you are. And Chris Herndon yeah, didn't do much either. Yeah, it was a bad uh, game. Well, but their defense, actually. Sticking with that actually... Thursday night game, we have Broncos tight end Noah Fent, uh, most likely going to miss week five with an ankle injury. The Broncos are already missing Philip Lindsay, Cortland Sutton, now Noah Fent. Um, I guess Jerry Judy is the undisputed number one now. And Tim Patrick uh, asserted himself on Thursday. Well, we can talk about him now. Uh, but with KJ Hamler out uh, as well with a hamstring injury, uh, same the same injury he missed week one with. Um, does I guess where do you put Jerry Judy now in your weekly rankings? I really don't. I I still put him low, like WR four or five, only because Rippin Brett Rippin is the quarter. I mean, look at they're down. It's the quarterback. You you, you got to factor in the quarterback here. Um, he's not afraid to throw it though. I'll give him that. No, he's not he's afraid, not to, afraid throw to throw he's it. Not afraid to throw it. But I think we gotta. I think it kind of gotta wait for Drew Locke to get back for him to to rise for him to be a safe start again. I think you got to stash him until until Drew Locke gets back. Till there's a little bit more stability, and of course, this means big, uh, big, big things for Melvin Gordon. Uh, he's gonna get a ton of carries now moving forward, even more so than he was. Yeah, no, uh, that's definitely. there's always a good side to it, and that's probably one of them. Yeah. All right, and I guess the most recent news, uh, not really fantasy related per se, but could have some, uh, could make some ripples. Bill O'Brien was fired by the Texans after an 0 4 start. Uh, Texans have really disappointed over the last few years uh, with Deshaun Watson. Not Deshaun's fault, but uh, they're going to make some changes. Um, Romeo Cornell coming in as a head coach. Yeah. Do you see the Texans' offense getting any better? Um, it's just in terms of Deshaun Watson scoring. You know, Will Fuller, Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks put up a big zero. Uh, David Johnson, or is the defensively oriented Cornell gonna slow things down a little bit? Yeah, I was just gonna mention that is that Romeo Cornell is uh, more of the uh, defensive uh, coach. He's been uh, defensive coordinator, like so. So this is more on the defense. I think what it does, though, I think it kind of loosens up the. Uh, I think it loosens up the playbook, and it might. Um, I I can't even remember. Like uh, I know uh, Romeo Cornell uh, used to coach for the Chiefs, and uh, oh, that reminds me. Yeah, uh, do you remember that uh, Cornell? He saw one of his players commit suicide in the parking lot or something like that. Uh, I don't remember that, but that's absolutely awful. I know it's terrible, but but that was uh, um, I think that was the same year he got he was fired from the Chiefs. But anyway, uh, yeah, look that up. It's quite uh, quite a shocking story. That is, um, forget the name of the player. But anyway, um, yeah, but he's a defensive minded coach, and so like for the life of me, I cannot I cannot uh, think of uh, how he styled the Chiefs' offense. I, I can't even remember back. I think this was 2012 that he uh, was head coach. So I, I don't know. He was know. head coach for the Browns, right? He was only yes, the Browns. The I think the Browns before the Chiefs, right? But uh, yes, I, and this is going back quite a ways, and uh, it's beyond my memory of what what it was like because this is nearly like ten years ago, right? So um, I think it might loosen up the offense a little bit, maybe. Uh, I think he. I think there might be a. A willingness to try things they they might they might get a little bit experimental which is good which is good I, you, sometimes you see that with interim coaches they well we're 0-4 we uh, we could be 0-5 I'm I'm not gonna I'm likely not gonna get fired I'm gonna be here until uh and I, I'm not sure if Romeo Cornell is the kind of guy that says well I've got to do really good so that I you know so I can get the interview you know um so I mean, the Texans have nothing to lose. They have no. to play to win. They don't have a first-round pick. They don't have a second-round pick. They, those both belong to the Dolphins. Yeah. So the move they made, this is the, what the Texans believe is going to help them win. And they will do anything they can to not, you know, give the Dolphins... Will they take Trevor Lawrence? I don't think they will, obviously, with with uh, with Tua there. But that's a lot of draft capital they've given, they gave Miami. Yeah, they did. And there was the Laramie Tunzel thing. Yeah. Uh, that's how they got those picks, I believe, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. But... 
That's yeah. right. Uh, that's how they got not the, the great. Maybe Cronell can help out Brandon Cooks a little bit. Uh, no catches on three targets this week, I believe. Um, just can't really happen for... Uh, they gave up a first rounder or a second rounder to take on his his albatross contract. I cannot remember. Uh, I think my it was memories. a second. Anyways, they gave up a pick, a high pick, yeah. to the Rams to take that contract, and they're just not using him, or he's washed. But um, either way, that's not good. And yeah, hopefully, Cornell can I, fix that. They will experiment. I think. I think the Texans will start to experiment uh, with their uh, with the offense now a little bit more. They might. They might even try to do some of the things that. Um, that the Ravens are doing with, uh, and get to, uh, don't, because I think one thing O'Brien was doing was, uh, was keeping Watson in the pocket and, and not getting him to run. I think, I think, uh, Watson's, I think Watson, if he starts using the wheels, I think that's what they would try to do. I know he's had, I know he had that, ha- uh, the, uh, the knee injury, uh, like in his rookie season, but he, he, I, I don't. Th- I think he's well past that now. I think he could, um, you know, start putting the wheels on. There, I think there'll be some experimenting, some interesting experimenting going on with the Texans. Yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Like, after, like you said, it's been a while since Cornell has been a coach, so yep. we just have to wait and kind of see how the scheme uh, shapes up. Yep. Anyways, let's move on to our uh, our observations segment for this week. Uh, much talked about the. Anyways, your observation. A. Uh, I guess much talked about offense struggling a little bit, especially against uh, against the Lions. What what uh, what did you notice this week, Richard? What I noticed this week, and it's actually been sort of brewing for the ever since the season began, is how much of a factor uh, um, Hopkins is having on the Cardinals' offense. It is too it's too imposing for the rest of the players. Like like I was looking at this afternoon. I took I took some time to take a look at what Larry Fitzgerald's been doing. Now Larry Fitzgerald's sort of kind of a set piece in there. He's just playing out the string. And I think that was kind of like the same thing sort of last year. But last season he was getting like six or seven targets a game. This season he's getting like three or four targets a season uh, a game. Pardon me. So uh, so you he's. His involvement in the offense is sort of like Hopkins is so imposing on this uh, on this offense that and obviously uh, Hopkins has a way of getting open and um, it just goes to show you the skill level Hopkins has for him to impose himself so much on an offense that it actually harms his teammates <laughs> for fantasy purposes. I mean, even the running backs you were talking about, like no catches for uh, for Drake. Um, no targets for Drake. <laughs> no targets for Drake. And, uh, so Hopkins, th- this is this is a bit of a problem. They got to sort of, uh, the Cardinals have to expand this offense a little bit more, make it a little more diverse. It's too, it's too Hopkins-centered at the moment. And um, I think it might be causing them this is one of the reasons it's causing them to start losing is because yeah, uh, I, you were mentioning just uh, DeAndre Hopkins being imposing just among the uh, Cardinals wide receivers, you know, Hopkins, uh, Fitzgerald, Andy Isabella, Christian Kirk and Keyshawn Johnson. Uh, over the first four weeks, Hopkins has had going back from week four to week one, uh, 45% of the targets, 46% of the targets, 41% of the targets, and 62% of the wide receiver targets over those four weeks. Yeah. There's not a ton of balance going on, like you're saying. And, um, maybe they got predictable, especially, you know, he had nine, nine targets this week coming off a week where he didn't practice and the offense did not look good. Uh, Kyler Mar- Murray didn't look good. Uh, they lost to the Lions, which is never ideal. Well, excuse me, the Panthers, not the Lions. The, the, the Panthers. Panthers. Well, the Panthers. Again, not ideal. Um, and I don't know, maybe they need to expand things. Andy Isabella looks like somebody that can stretch the field, you know, make some big plays. He yeah. had a season high uh, snap count, 42%, but only had three targets. Um, I don't know. Like you said, it's it's a weird thing. They might need to involve the running backs a little bit more. Kenyon Drake has five targets total on the season. After averaging four and a half last year uh, with the Cardinals, so not really sure what the game plan is and why they would change it so drastically um, in the yeah. new season. But hey, what do I know? I'm not but an NFL coach. Just to add to this a little bit is that I don't think there's a. I don't. I really don't know what the cure is because Hopkins is like he's um, Kyler Murray's going to throw it to the to the open man, right? And if Hopkins is always the open man, I mean. What do you do? I mean, you you can't just just uh, leave Mo there. It's, the reason it, it's it's Hopkins' talent that is that is doing it, and of he needs he he needs what Hopkins needs is somebody like Will Fuller. Will Fuller is uh, 
is a little step up from the other guys on the Cardinals. Like he's just like if if I was to say who would you rather own, Christian Kirk, Will Fuller, who would you rather own, Will Fuller or any other, you know, the, the answer is simple, right? Yeah. They need somebody that 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 raises uh, that's that's a little bit closer to Hopkins' skill level. And I think that's that's what they have to do. And obviously, it can't be done this year. I mean, Larry's too old. Hey, Antonio Brown is eligible to play in four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they wanted him on the team, but uh, but you know what I'm talking about, right? To get that yeah, balance, I think they need a they think they need a uh, a receiver a of that level, a deep guy. Yeah, Cause Isabella, he's a big yards after catch guy from what I've seen, but not somebody that you can just you know run a go route and go up and get it like Will Fuller, like yeah. you said. But but, it's hurt, but he's hurting he's hurting the other fantasy prospects for yes. sure. Uh, speaking of hurting fantasy prospects, um. I guess my thing from this week is the Colts' commitment to spreading the backfield touches. Um, obviously, Jonathan Taylor is just a rookie. Maybe they're trying to ease him in, but didn't quite make sense to me there. Uh, granted, I didn't watch the game, but just the, distrib- the distribution of the backfield touches. Jonathan Taylor had uh, 17 carries, uh, averaged four yards a carry, had about 60-ish yards. Sorry, my math is bad, but he averaged four yards a carry on 17 carries. But And then Naeem Hines and Jordan Wilkins combined for 18 carries, and Wilkins averaged under two yards a carry. Hines averaged two, two and a half yards a carry. And I don't know if, again, they're trying to ease Taylor in or, you know, something happened, but I feel like not giving your best running back, your rookie running back, the touches and giving Jordan Wilkins eight carries who, you know, he turned it into 15 yards or something like that. I just, it doesn't make sense. And it's, I guess, a game against that, a low scoring, you know, slow paced game against the Bears. You want to spread out the touches, but, oh, it, it, I don't know. I don't know what they're, what they're really doing with Taylor unless they want to scale back the touches so he doesn't get hurt, but. It's a weird thing, and unless um, they kind of establish him as the guy, you know, 20 touches a game, it's going to be a weird that he's not really an RB1 for fantasy purposes because uh, you can't trust that he's going to get, you know, the the consistent 20-plus carries and goal line stuff that you'd expect from a second-round running back. I don't know if it was game script or, or whatever it was. The Bears game was sort of weird. I mean, it was very defensive. Now, the, this is one thing, too, is the Colts are now officially uh, the – number one defense in the NFL. And yeah. but usually that means that uh, you when you have the uh, strong defense, it kind of goes hand in hand with a strong running game. But you're right, it's it does seem a little bit odd that they didn't rely fully on uh, Jonathan Taylor. They tried to uh, mix maybe there was just maybe there was a matchup problem that they uh, that Reich was a little bit concerned about. It's kind of hard to see. It's kind of hard to say to, and to see Wilkins and and Wilkins was actually put in there a lot in in the previous week as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, Hines, and Hines is suddenly nowhere. I mean, like it looked like the the Colts were doing all the right things in Week One. Now Hines is almost practically. I mean, if you if you got him if you got him stashed, he might be just droppable uh, at this point. Uh, I don't know if I'd say droppable. Hines did have a good number of touches this week. I think he had eight carries and a few catches. Let me double check on that. Wasn't heavy. He had- very he had eight light. carries and three catches. So, I mean, you're not rostering him as an RB1, but 11 touches isn't bad for as slow, for a game that was as slow paced as this one. Yeah. I, so I think, I think with this game, we can sort of, sort of, when, when the, when the Colts, I think the interesting thing will be was when the Colts start playing more offensive teams in the league. I don't know who, who's their next big offense. And I have to look it up actually to see who they're. The Colts have Cleveland next week. Cleveland next so week. So that, that, well, that that could that could that could be nice considering be, they just they just dropped forty nine on the Cowboys, but they're a good test case, maybe, Jono. Yeah, maybe. Um, now nah, we'll have to see again. Like I think Kevin mentioned this last week, Jonathan Taylor hasn't exceeded expectations. He's taking what the Colts O line is giving him, and he's not really pushing it further. But that might be why they're not using him to the fullest. But again, that's something that's gonna have to develop over the rest of the year, and we'll we'll watch and see how that one goes. Mm. All right, let's move on to our uh, our next segment here. Moving on up. Uh, there's only going to be two We're of us this week, so up. we can, we can, we can <laughs> yep. hit some extra players this week. Richard, who you got? Uh, moving on up, obviously, is... Well, not obviously, but um, he's certainly entitled to be moving on up because he did the job, and that's Justin Herbert. 
Um, if you uh, aren't happy with your current quarterback, I think you can uh, take uh, Justin Herbert for a spin. Um, he's not going to have great weeks all every week, but uh, but if he keeps growing at this rate, he's growing because he seems to like definitely looks like he's enjoying being out there. And he enjoys throwing the ball, and he was he was actually you could tell he was like testing that arm on. Uh, just, just tossing it down the field. Hey, look what I can do, uh, old man. <laughs> look, you can't because yeah. he just he those, sailed uh, a beautiful pass. Those, those bombs, fifty-two yards, seventy-three yards. Jalen Guyton and Tyrone Johnson, exactly who we thought he was going to be throwing to. Yeah, at the start of the year. Do you but think? Just he, pin, you think it was showing off. off to Brady, like the old man, like, look, you can't do this anymore. I bet. <laughs> I, I mean. He he did, <laughs> though. Yeah, he, he did. did. He did. Like uh, Brady, Brady says, "Okay, kid." Brady, uh, to quote yeah. Michael Jordan, Brady said, uh, "And I took that personally." And then he showed up the kid. But <laughs> I agree, though. Justin Herbert looks good. Uh, he looks a part of a starting quarterback. He passes the eye test. Yep. And Anthony Lynn still refuses to, you know, commit to Herbert for the rest of the year, which is it, which is insane to me. Uh, I feel like I going back to Tyrod after this is is like that bordering is on a fireball offense. That would be that would be fireball. Nah, they, they're not taking him out. No, because Tyrod Taylor, Tyra so. Taylor was never going to be the Tyler. Tyler, uh, is, uh, why do I keep saying that? Tyrod Taylor. Oh, Tyrod. Yes, excuse me, I forgot about that. Tarod. That's last year's thing. <laughs> why do I keep saying it? But anyway, Tyrod, uh, they're not going to bring him back. Why? 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 It wouldn't make sense. He was a bridge quarter to begin with. He was the bridge. He was the bridge to Justin Herbert. Well, across the bridge, like sure, it was a bad accident, and um, and but you know, with the doctors and the puncture, I just you don't you don't you don't, you don't they got things going. I mean, they lost the game, but. Um, you're the, the well, that's exactly why Lynn is saying that you know he he said what was it uh, I can't say that he anybody played outstanding because we lost he just refuses to you know praise Herbert for a good game it's just such a weird thing for a coach to do I understand you know the win mentality you know it's all about winning the NFL but damn give, give, give your quarterback some praise he you know kept the minute or you know he went touchdown for touchdown with you know Tom Brady and a, a much better Bucks offense and it's just a weird thing not to do not even to say that he had a good game you know yeah uh, I just I just don't think it was yeah you got to uh, pop up your play do you know how many do you know how many teams do you think the Bears would want Justin Herbert you bet Justin Bear they, they would they would start Justin Herbert in a second the Bears. The Bears would want Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes too, but they they made their bed. They made their bed. Yeah, they they traded up for Trubisky, <laughs> and that's who they got. And Trubisky, who is he used in the same class as uh, Watson? Was Mahomes it? and Watson. Yeah, Mahomes and Watson. Those are the so, two. Yeah, but oh, just even without hindsight, that was a bad move at the time. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, we'll move on to mine. We'll stick actually with we we're talking about the Colts a lot. I'm going with uh, Zach Pascal or is it Pascal? Either way, Pascal. I think Zach uh, Pascal. You know, the announcer um, said Pascal, so I'll go with that. Uh, all right, I'll stick with Pascal. Um, the Colts' passing game is looking kind of out of sync. Uh, Rivers doesn't really have a go-to guy yet, um, but it could it could be Pascal moving forward. Uh, T.Y. Hilton not doing great. Uh, it's possible that. The hamstring injuries and all the the little things over the years have slowed him down. Uh, he's not playing very well this year. Uh, I think, Richard, you wrote the yardage down here. He's got 53, 28, 52, and 29 yards uh, in each of the weeks so far. No touchdowns. He hasn't had over 87 yards since Andrew Luck retired. Uh, so that's Yikes. two years. He's gone without surpassing 87 yards uh, in a game, which, yeah, that's not good. And Pascal this week led the Colts in targets, uh, 58 yards on eight targets, three catches against the Bears, which not bad against a good, uh, a good defense. And again, this week he's got Cleveland, who almost blew a 27 point lead to the Cowboys. So oh, dear. we'll see how that game goes. I think if, uh, you know, he builds, if Pascal builds that relationship with Rivers, I think he could be the, uh, the new, I guess, most targeted guy, especially with Pittman and Paris Campbell out for extended periods of time. Yeah, I, it's like, it, this is kind of ties into what we were saying, is that we're kind of waiting for the Colts to uh, get into an offensive shootout, to get into a game where they have to, uh, uh, where they have, kind of have to get out this uh, defensive mode a little bit and get into, uh, um, get into opening up the offense. I think it's probably where a guy like Hines will come into it and other people. Uh, but Zach Pascal, uh, Zach Pascal, 
Yeah, he said it. Um, yeah, he's a guy that uh, certainly has taken the reins, and he's got to take the reins because T.Y. Hilton. Rivers obviously isn't interested in him, and I noticed that even, too, when Paris kept before Paris Campbell got injured in his uh, first game, like after week one. Uh, Paris Campbell looked like, uh, I think that that was the guy uh, who, uh, I I would bet you any money that that was the guy that... Uh, uh, Philip Rivers was was looking for in in training camp, and he was thinking. Uh, uh, Philip Rivers was thinking, "Yeah, this is my this is my money guy, this 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 Paris Campbell." But then he gets injured, so Rivers is kind of uh, he's kind of like a boat without oars. Now he's well, one of the oars. He's now he's got to sort of make things up, and he's still not happy with Tilton. And but I guess it's going to have to be Pascal. But but he's taking taking a while for for it to emerge. He, for for Pascal to emerge, um, we had. Pittman, and then he got injured too. So I don't know what's going to happen now. I I don't even know who's who's the who's the third. Uh, do you? Is there? I don't have a depth chart up. I should have these ready. We were. I was a bit late getting to the po- uh, podcast, ladies and gentlemen. So yep. Uh, so Pascal had eight. Hilton had five. Uh, Trey Burton had five. Uh, tight end. Ali Cox had two. Jack Doyle had one, and then a couple other wide receivers. We had. D- Darius Fountain and Marcus Johnson. So, yeah, Pascal is gonna, <laughs> Pascal has a ton of targets available to him if he can if he can step up and build that relationship with Rivers for sure. He's got to do it. Yep. Okay. Let's go. Uh, what do we got here? Oh, panic button. Everybody's favorite. Uh, I had the reverse jinx last week, so uh, let's hope it works again. Uh, Richard, you can start though. Uh, it's got to be DJ Moore. Uh, DJ Moore. The the problem with uh, Moore and 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 I've put him into the uh, slot. Like he had uh, just this week, uh, six targets, four receptions, forty nine yards. He still can't find the end zone with Bridgewater. Bridgewater had a good game, by the way. It, uh, he ran it in for a touchdown, which I mean, if for fantasy, we we always look at it from the fantasy point of view. I guess it, from a fantasy point of view, Bridgewater ran it in for a touchdown. It's always nice. It was a good touchdown too. Is where he, he looked. He's got a bit of wheels going there. And uh, but the problem is, is that this the offense of the Panthers cannot support two high grade receivers. And Robbie Anderson, uh, I consider him kind of in that range of good wide receivers, like not just a not just a guy type of receiver. And he's kind of eaten into the. Uh, into Moore's and and this this offense way it's structured cannot support to uh un, unlike the Cardinals what we were talking about the Cardinals this the Panthers are a little bit are a little bit lower on the scale of what they can support whereas the Cardinals can support a uh, a second great wide receiver whereas the the structure and the scheme so to speak of the of the Panthers just cannot support uh DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson therefore Robbie Anderson is I think is holding down DJ Moore uh, because you're going to have weeks where Robbie Anderson does well. And it, it's, it's pushing. If you drafted DJ Moore high, uh, I feel bad for you because now DJ Moore is starting to sink down into low WR2 territory. Slowly, slowly. He's, um, uh, for, for where you drafted, uh, him, you're, you gotta hope you, you're actually living on hope right now that, uh, things change, but I don't see it changing in the very near future. Not with, uh, Robbie Anderson there. Yeah. Moore is in a tough position. I mean, if you break down the Panthers receiving numbers, uh, Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore are always in top three in targets, receptions, receiving yards and receiving touchdowns. But yeah, the third, uh, the third I guess person or third thing in those in the in those top threes in those categories is the running backs, whether it be Christian McCaffrey or Mike Davis, right. uh, like the running backs or Reggie Bonifon. Uh, the running backs have 33 targets, uh, more than DJ Moore combined. Uh, the running backs have 30 receptions, uh, which is which leads the team combined. You know, um, it's a lot of passing to McCaffrey, Mike Davis, and if they're siphoning so many targets, it's tough for Morty going, who's you know not not a big air yards guy if i'm not mistaken he's more of an after catch underneath guy yeah uh so and he only has 18 receptions this year which is not not great 18 receptions on 32 targets for somebody like dj moore is not not great maybe it just takes time for bridgewater to get to him and with more at the moment you can't really 
trade him for much. I don't think people are going to be giving you the value that you'd kind of need if you're going to trade him. So yeah, owners are in a bit of a, a bit of a bad position with Moore and I'd be panicking a little bit considering how much, like you said, Bridgewater seems to be liking uh, Robbie Anderson. Yeah, because he's the Robbie Anderson playmaker. You could tell right away. I mean, DJ Moore, workhorse, right? And and that's the thing is uh, workhorses are good for fantasy if they get the work. <laughs> and so, but, he, but he's not getting enough uh, work. I mean, six targets, yeah, that's great. You know, it's, it's not bad, but, but for the position he plays and the, and the type of... But, it doesn't uh, it doesn't cut very well that's and uh, another guy to mention too is Curtis Samuel he gets in there he gets his he gets his uh, two or three every game and so it doesn't help but I don't know but you're right about the uh, the running backs are are key are very key for uh, for receiving in in the offense so yeah I just can't support both so, so I'm if I, I'm really kind of worried about DJ Moore he's a panic button for me for sure and speaking of uh, it's a good segue there uh, receiving running backs my panic this week is Kenyon Drake um I I actually we talked about this on the Fantasy Six Pack Hour with Joe and AJ on Thursday. We discussed Kenyon Drake as a as a decent buy low. Uh despite his low fantasy point outputs, um over the first three weeks he had he was averaging just under twenty touches per game and we discussed the possibility that, you know, Kyler Murray running in from one yard out every time wasn't really sustainable. Um, obviously Cam Newton and Josh Allen do it, but they're significantly larger people than, than Kyler Murray. So eventually those goal line touches and, uh, would normalize and the targets would normalize a little bit to the point where I believe Derrick Henry is averaging more targets a game than Kenyon Drake, which is criminal in a way. <laughs> That's terrible. But, that is bad. And, um, and, and, uh, also James Robinson too. And James Robinson, not known as a pass catching back. They worked him in as a pass catching back. Yeah. It's, <laughs> It's a weird thing. Like in his time with the Cardinals last year, Drake averaged 4.4 yards a carry. Now he's averaging 1.2, uh, had no targets this week and just add insult or injury to all this insult. He left late in the game, uh, with what was called a chest injury. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury's come out and said that he, it's fine. He's had the wind knocked out of him. He's already practicing in full. So not nothing to worry about there. But what's really concerning is Chase Edmonds, who was thought to be nothing more than a backup, is actually getting a lot of the targets people thought were going to be going to Drake. Uh, over the first four weeks, he's got five, four, two, and six. He had six targets uh, on Sunday. So not really sure how this is going to continue breaking down, considering how inefficient Drake has been with his touches. Uh, and he didn't have as many carries. He only had 13 carries on Sunday. Uh, his lowest of the season for just 35 yards uh, in what should have been a, uh, a good spot against the Panthers. So it's tough to say. Uh, keep in mind, listeners, I had Joe Mixon in my panic button. <laughs> last week so I, I reverse jinxed him where he came out and just absolutely exploded so i'm hoping i do the same thing for Kenyon drake because he gets the jets this week uh in week five so if he's not breaking out against the jets then there are gonna be some problems for somebody that was a uh uh mid ish second round pick there, in, uh, in, in drafts the worst part about it is that though the jets are um, a little bit. The Jets are actually pretty good defense. As as uh, uh, I think the Jets scored more fantasy points, fantasy points wise. Uh, it's always good to talk in fantasy points because it's a good way of measuring a defense. But scored more fantasy points than the Broncos, if you can believe it. No, well, ripping just you know tossing it down the field with reckless abandon. Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna work out well most of the time. No, but there there definitely is a problem up front with the the line. There's not a lot of holes opening up for uh, for. Kenyon Drake, uh, I own him in the Scott Fishball, and uh, same. Yeah, I'm kind of worried about it, and he's definitely panic. I, I'm really panicking about having him, and like you say, uh, the possibility, the ever present Chase Edmonds um, starting to like move in on on the territory a little bit more and more. If, uh, if the especially if the Cardinals don't start winning, but again, this kind of goes back to the Hopkins thing I talked about earlier too, and so it's it, that that could be part of the problem, maybe is is the the imposition of hopkins so but i certainly hope not if things turn around hopefully like you say if it's reverse uh was it uh 
jinxing or whatever it is. Yeah, uh, it just uh, hopefully the reverse jinx works. And just like Joe Mixon did, uh, Kenyon Drake's gonna explode for what was it, forty fantasy points or something this past week and half PPR. Just it's a good week, <laughs> and hopefully Drake can bust out of this soon because the Cardinals' offense does not look good without a viable running game. No. Uh, well, I guess speaking of Joe Mixon, let's move on to everybody's favorite segment. That's right. I guess, uh, Richard. I guess we take. Uh, we know who your nominee for Mister Unlimited is this week. Yeah, it's going to be John. It's got to be Joe Mixon because, well, last week um, he was on the panic button, and and it wasn't just you, John. We all agreed with it. We all talked about it. Yeah, Joe Mixon. So what does he do? He thought, well, I'm going to show those guys on the fantasy edge. So I'm going to show them. <laughs> He did. If Joe yeah. Mixon listen to our show, he can do whatever he can do whatever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. If you listen to our show, then that's fine. Um, I think he should be our Mister Unlimited as a as a kind of uh, apology in a way for 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 saying that he was re- in real trouble for owners. And I I I just don't think I think he's still in the cat. I think he's still in the sit start sit column. Okay, you don't. He's he's not a like an every week starter. I think I think uh, Joe Mixon is still is going to be matchup based, and I think um, he's a start sit column running back still. But he was Mister Unlimited for me this this week. He was my candidate. I wasn't supposed and... to. I wasn't supposed to nominate. Kevin was supposed to nominate, and I was supposed to t- pick. But That's I think okay. we'll I think Kevin would have chose. Here. I think Kevin would have chose Joe Mixon. <laughs> and in keeping with the spirit, uh, the Bengals actually won a, won their game this week, first of the year, first career win for Joe Burrow so nice for him Uh, so we're only allowed to nominate people that won I was going to nominate Dak but the comeback didn't materialize quite as well as I would hope Uh, but honorable mention to Dak for throwing 500 yards uh, and still losing the Cowboys you know that's funny you mentioned the Cowboys is that um, a meme came out and I think that they said if uh, it was basically this, if if you didn't know the Cowboys changed coaches, would you still think Garrett was the coach of the Cowboys? Did the Cowboys score this much, this consistently with Garrett? I feel like Garrett's teams were just boring and had really nothing. McCarthy's worked the offense very well. Oh no, I had the, the defense Cowboys were, was just awful. Were, yeah, I think that's where their problems stem. But just basically, they're still not winning games they should, which is what was happening with Garrett. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like if Garrett had this this version of the defense, then he would have been fired a lot sooner because that was brutal. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty bad. Yeah, especially uh, especially well, letting Odell Beckham run down the sidelines like that. That just that just doesn't happen. You yeah, know, to close out well, the game. I mean, they they made a and that looks bad on the Browns too because the Browns actually let the Cowboys get back into the game quite you know a little bit easy. So, but but that's another story. The Browns are the Browns. The Browns have their own issues going on, but they seem to be, they look pretty good. They look pretty good. Baker's Baker's. Well, turned we'll see to, how things go without yeah. Nick Chubb this coming week. Their yeah. bread and butter has been you know just feeding the two running backs, but can Hunt Hunt can't take all of Nick Chubb's carries. So we'll have to figure out how they divide it, but. Anyway, so finish your thought. Yep. My Mr. Unlimited is got to be a winner for this week, and I'm going to go with Brady. Um, people are writing him off all all of this week. Uh, he was on so many, you know, sit lists uh, with the Chargers defense and turned back the clock through 369 yards, five touchdowns, uh, and a comeback win. And, you know, and this is without... Chris Godwin with Mike Evans hobbled with OJ Howard tearing his Achilles with a broken shell of Gronk and just throwing it to Scotty Miller. So I'm giving him the uh, I'm giving him the Homer pick here. Tom Brady showing us why he is the greatest quarterback uh, of all time. And it was also it was also just a fun game to watch with Herbert and Brady going at it. So yeah, I'm going with Brady for my for my nominee this week. All right, so now we got to hash it out. Well. I I can I can lean toward Brady a little bit, and he made it uh, made it an exciting game, and it was it was a great contrast between young gunslinger versus the old. And uh, I don't know if Brady was ever kind of like gunslinger in the sense of of the other guys who we considered gunslingers, like the of his era, like Philip Rivers or Jay Cutler, for example. You know, not like a you know, yeah, not like a Rivers Cutler Brett Favre kind of gunslinger, but uh late 2000s you know obviously the 2007 team uh brady was throwing and then 
I guess his, I, I don't know, his gunslinging abilities and all that kind of stuff uh, kind of went under the radar, I guess, as it were, as much as I can for somebody with as many accomplishments as him because of the defenses that he played with. But yeah, but I, it was more of a gunslinger in his earlier years, I guess, in his earlier career. Kind yeah, of, like, of course. Uh, but and I'll, I'll let you make the uh, the final call here since I picked last week. Well, I, I and I don't think you disagree with Joe Mixon being Mr. No, Unlimited. Uh, Joe Mixon, well, I... I he was the second highest fantasy scorer this week behind Dak, but Dak didn't win his game, so he's he's disqualified from this. Yeah, so I, I think I think we kind of owe it to Joe Mixon to give it to him because of our because um, we kind of downgraded him last week, and yeah. and, and actually the Cincinnati offense and, and Joe, Joe Burrow's uh, really fitting into the role quite nicely. So he is. Uh, so here he is, uh, Mister Unlimited. Joe Mixon. Mr. Perfect. Unlimited. And shockingly, this is the first Mr. Unlimited where Russell Wilson himself was not a nominee because yeah. he didn't have that great of a game. Oh, uh, Russell. Yeah, Russell. Yeah, they won. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, any yeah. any game where Russ is not throwing for, you know, 350 yards and four touchdowns this season just seems a little off. I don't know. <laughs> Russell scoring 20 fantasy points. Oh, that's, that's a yeah. bad game. <laughs> Only 20. Only, Only 21. Tall. Well, he, he went 31, 34, 36 over the first three <laughs> weeks yeah you get, and then you, he had the and then he got the dolphins so we all figured this was going to be you know another 35 point game but no i didn't i didn't i didn't i i think there's a lot of truth in this uh west coast to east coast travel uh body clock stuff yeah he was outscored by fitzpatrick we'll say fitzpatrick did outscore him for fantasy purposes yeah so, so i kind of i kind of expected the seahawks to be a little bit flat uh, because they always, I mean, because of that body clock thing. I know a lot of people don't believe that, but I, I, I think there's something to it. Yeah, I mean, traveling across the country, it's got to be tough for them, for yeah. sure. So that's they get the, the they get the Vikings next at home, so they should be okay. All right. Uh, let's move on to our waiver wire section. Of course, you have until Wednesday. Wednesday morning to make your picks. Uh, Richard, who do you got as a, uh, well, I guess QBs, there weren't many this week. We already talked about Justin Herbert, Teddy Bridgewater. Um, anybody else you can think of for a waiver wire QB? Uh, well, I, I, I put Kirk Cousins on his on our list and kind of lukewarm on him. But I think uh, as a spot start next week against uh, Russell Wilson, I think uh, Kirk Cousins, because he's going to have to keep up with Russell and because uh, they're going to be playing at Century Link. So... Kirk Cousins, yeah, I, I think Kirk Cousins is a good guy to pick up and start if you uh, if you need a good quarterback next week. So uh, I consider Kirk Cousins like a, a a good streamer. Yeah, I'll agree with you there. There's, uh, yes, yeah, Cousins is a pretty much a good of a streamer as it comes. Uh, Seattle's, uh, I guess they're giving up a ton of fantasy points to quarterbacks uh, to this point. So yeah. with Cousins and you know the Vikings defense is not good, so he's gonna have to throw uh, to throw a ton as well. So volume good, good play there. Yeah. Um, moving on to the running backs, I guess we talked about, you know, the Browns and running heavy. So I guess a uh, pickup this week we uh, alluded to him earlier would be Dearness, uh, Dearness Johnson. He had 13 carries uh, this week, racked up 93 yards, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, pl- played very well. Again, take it with a bit of a grain of salt. You know, he it was the Cowboys, and for the most part, Johnson was uh, running with the lead. Sorry, 13 carries, 95 yards, excuse me. But yeah, running with a lead. Um, again, Hunt is going to be taking the majority of these backfield touches, but Johnson could work his way into, you know, uh, spelling Kareem Hunt. 10, 12 touches, depending on game script. Um, is he a must-add for you, Richard? He's a must-add, but as for must-start, I don't know about that. But he is a must. He is a must stash. <laughs> Get it? Yes. <laughs> That's what he did there. He's a must. I like that. Um, so, uh, so I put the mustache on him. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Dearness Johnson. You definitely, you definitely gotta have him because I mean he's the backup to, and especially if you. Uh, if you own Chubb, you should try and get him um, because he might might fill the role. But whether you start him in the flex, hmm, hmm, things that make you go, hmm, I'm not sure it is. It, it's, it's a quantity. I don't know if you can start him, but uh, he's definitely a guy you got to have. He's definitely somebody you need to have on your bench. He's a more wait and see, but in desperation, I think you can start him if you're desperate. Yeah, for sure. Now, everybody keep in mind that the Browns do have the Colts, who, as we mentioned earlier, have the league's uh, number one defense so far. So let's uh, temper expectations. We don't expect another 95 yards from uh, 
from Dearness Johnson for sure. Uh, wide receivers didn't do too badly this week uh, in terms of guys you know owned under thirty five percent of Yahoo leagues. Um, I had Tim Patrick. We mentioned him again a little bit earlier with the injury to Noah Fant, but. 20 fantasy he, points. Sorry? 20 fantasy points. Yeah, 116 or 113 yards and a touchdown, you know, six catches. Uh, led the team in targets, and he has a touchdown two straight games. Um, now, this passing game is basically just Patrick and Jerry Judy, and the way Brett Rippon is throwing it, so somebody's going to somebody's gonna come down with, uh, with a ton of, uh, you know, air yards and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, Patrick, um, at least for the next couple of weeks, while Fant is on the sidelines, good... Uh, if you're desperate for a wide receiver or you have Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, any any Lions on on a buy, uh, then that's a good option. Tim Patrick has a as a bye week fill in. He's a safe uh, yeah, he's a good bye week fill in and and actually a safe flex even uh, without a bye week problem. Uh, when do the buys week uh, the buys start after week five, right? Week nope, they start next week. Marvin uh, the Lions and I think the Packers might be on a buy next that's week. That's right, yes, that's right. We have week five. That's right. So yeah, the first two. Yeah, that's right. It goes two two to start. Yes. Yep. So if you have uh Devontae Adams, if you have Marquez Valdez Scantling, if you had uh if you had Alan Lazard uh, Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, Tim Patrick would be a uh, a fine bye week fill in for those guys. Yep, I like it. Uh, any receivers you got, Richard? Uh, not really. I mean, we talked about Scotty Miller, um, but Traquan Smith, uh, he's another guy. I think you, um, if you have room on your bench, and again, similar to Patrick, um, scored two touchdowns on Sunday. Uh, did um, getting open, and I think he's the guy. Uh, I know a lot of people were. We're looking at Deontay Harris, but I, it's got to be uh, Traquan Smith while Michael Thomas is out. I don't know where he is. I don't know why. But if Michael Thomas is still out, you got to have Traquan Smith while uh, Michael Thomas is out. I, I don't know the latest news. I kind of half expected him to be back this week. I mean, but um, if Michael Thomas isn't playing, you can start um trick on smith he's proved it in the flex yeah i mean uh michael thomas it seems like he's on the cusp of returning and it seems like he's going to be uh seems like he'll be at least in a limited capacity anyways back next week but with the saints i believe they have a buy coming up after in week six so they might choose to keep him out to ensure nothing happens with the uh with the high ankle sprain uh, right. uh, for another couple of weeks yeah. so that's something everybody's got to watch out for yes they have a week six buy so but you notice- uh, they might choose to keep Thomas out one more week, get him two weeks of rest for the price of one game. Uh, so Traquan Smith, definitely somebody you should uh, pick up because he is very clearly ahead of uh, Manuel Sanders. Uh, Sanders just looks old and not quite up with the system yet. Nope. And Jared Cook is hobbled. He's got, what, groin injury? Uh, I think so. Yeah. And, yeah Cook, and Cook is also- hobbled. So missed this week, didn't practice at all. So it's not, uh, if he comes back, I don't think he'll be 100%. So Traquan Smith is going to be the... Uh, well, main wide receiver, anyways. Alvin, Alvin Kamara is the main actual receiver. But that's that's what you notice is like, and this kind of ties into my thoughts about the Cardinals is that Michael Thomas. But the, the Saints have kind of got their offense uh, a little bit right in the balance, like because uh, when Michael Thomas is in there, there's no other wide receiver you can take really. So the Cardinals are yeah. similar to that. Like, uh, uh, I mean, the Saints are similar to the Cardinals in that respect. Uh, okay, let's move on to tight ends. There wasn't a ton this week. Um, I guess one that I will mention uh, that again we mentioned off the top with the OJ Howard injury is Cameron Brait. Yep. Uh, Cameron Brait. For his Bucks career, all he's done is catch touchdowns because he's not a great blocker. So he's a red zone uh, weapon. And it happened again on Sunday. One target, one catch, three yards and a touchdown. And as you know, Howard gets hurt and Godwin's hurt and Evans is hurt now. And Gronk has proved himself to still be an elite blocker. I think you're going to see a lot more break, uh, especially in the red zone. Uh, I wouldn't expect a ton of targets uh, because you can't. Unless the unless uh, Bruce Arians is going to choose to split him out wide or in the slot, kind of like a Mike Gusecki, Evan Ingram kind of weapon, I don't see Brait in on a ton of snaps because he's not, again not a good blocker. Uh, used when he's used in line, so but in the red zone for sure, I think Brait's going to be a good weapon. Just he might be a little inconsistent, but if you need a dart throw or a streamer for a um for a touchdown, then yeah, Brait is a pretty solid flyer uh, for this week. Yeah. 
And uh, my my pick would be Robert Tanya, but that kind of depends on what he does tonight. But All because right. of what he did the previous night, but uh, well, that finishes off the waiver wire. Everybody's got their running backs, receivers, tight ends, uh, QBs. Not so much this week. Cousins, if you need a streamer, or Herbert, if you need a uh, a guy there as well. Yeah, uh, pretty thin. To... Pretty thin this week. Sorry? a little bit. Bit a bit thin on the waivers uh, this week. A little bit. Yeah, the because the, the running back injuries, every their their backups were already owned, <laughs> so it's not yeah. nothing really to scramble like when uh, Saquon or or McCaffrey got hurt. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to drops. Uh, this one's always fun. Uh, Richard, who you got this week? Well, I'm going to have to drop Greg Ward. If you picked him up um, thinking that he was the, uh, you know, because Philadelphia is is so thin at wide receiver that they're going to need somebody. Nope. Nope. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, Carson Wentz is saying, no, nope, I'm just going to go to Zach Ertz and Richard Rodgers. <laughs> I'm going to go to my tight ends and, and, uh, and throw the ball a lot to uh, Miles Sanders. And that's how I'm going to run the offense. So you can't try. Although there was this one guy, Fulgham or something, he scored the touchdown. But Travis he, Fulgham, yep. Travis Fulgham, yeah. You can't trust any of these guys. Um, you can dr- safely drop Ward and and not worry. I know a lot of people are probably picking up Ward, thinking that you know he's the only healthy wide receiver. Um, Wentz isn't interested, and he's also not interested in John Hightower, the rookie. Not much. Two yeah, catches. which was surprising. Hightower led the wide receivers in snaps uh, last week, but again, he just only had two two uh, two receptions this week or two targets this week, so not great. Uh, Ward. It's interesting, but yes, he had he led the team in wide receiver targets uh, this week. I mean, he led the team in targets. Ertz had five, Ward had seven, but San Francisco defense is tough. He couldn't turn it into much. He only had 38 yards. Uh, next week, it doesn't get any easier. He's got Pittsburgh. Week after that, he's got Baltimore. So even if he's getting volume, unless he scores a touchdown, I don't see him being very efficient with the targets. Um, if you're in a deeper league, you know, 14, 12 teams with deeper benches, that kind of thing, I can see holding on to him if you need a bye week filler or, you know, you have injuries. But yeah, Ward is not going to be... The Eagles offense in general is not great. Um, they won the game because of Nick Mullins and that awful, awful interception he threw. That's right. But... Nick Mullins just saw his career go up in smoke with that pick six. That was probably the worst interception I've ever seen. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, my drop for this week is going to be AJ Green. Uh, he was being drafted as a low wide receiver two, high wide receiver three in drafts, and he's been terrible. Uh, super inefficient with his targets. Uh, last this week he bottomed out. He had five targets, one reception, three yards. Uh, T Higgins looks like he's passed him up on the depth chart. Uh, T Higgins was second on the team receptions behind Tyler Boyd and green just doesn't look like himself. He looks slow. Uh, doesn't have that connection with Burrow yet. And he's really not worth, uh, not worth starting for sure. Um, You can hold him, but green is enough of a name where it's, you're playing a little bit of the waiver wire game too, right? You can send a landmine out to the waiver wire. Hope somebody uses their priority or their budget on AJ green and uh, see who you can snap up in the meantime. But yeah, Green, even in a good an offense as that's been passing as much as the Bengals, not doing much, not worth having on your team right now. Yeah, our the old trusty guys are just not uh, are just not as trusty anymore. Like uh, well, well, Larry Fitzgerald, Larry Fitzgerald is even beyond his his uh, um, heyday, and and so AJ Green's seen his heyday, and it's like uh, like it's AJ Green and like uh, what we were saying about Emmanuel Sanders, you know, like th- these guys are starting to uh, fall off the way side and you know it's it's like Demarius Thomas you know like Demarius Thomas his, his day has come and gone and I think I think we're kind of starting to see that with Green now he's getting passed by by these younger guys uh oh well except John Ross John Ross is off the <laughs> John. <laughs> yeah John Ross is uh he, he's gone he's gone but but AJ Green is starting to fall in that way but uh, but not not in the same way but um, you're starting to see the the older set guys, the the veterans, starting to give way to these uh, to these young bucks. So yeah, it's, For it's, sure. it's not good. It's and like you can even see that. Like I mean, even Amari Cooper, like he had a good game, but CD Lamb, whew, these young bucks, eh? They're, uh, they're coming in there and they're saying we're 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 here. Well, uh, speaking of, uh, I guess young receivers, we have a couple, couple ready to go in our spec ads. Why don't you, uh, why don't you go first? Yeah, Darius Shepard, uh, playing tonight. Um, if, if Devontae Adams is out, then, uh, you got a good, uh, desperation play here, uh, Darius Shepard. If you, in fact, I'm starting him in Scott Fishbowl because, uh, I have Devontae Adams and I picked him up during the week, um, because I wasn't sure if Adams was going to play or, well, it was actually because of Lazard. 
and and there's only um, MVS. So the only two the only two guys tonight. If you could, I think the game's already started, of course. But uh, Darius Shepard, I uh, look for him to have a good game. We'll see if this spec ad works out right. But uh, I don't think he'd be a spec ad if he does well. But uh, um, so this is kind of this is kind of an odd odd spec ad to give because if Darius Shepard does well, then well, that's great. But if Darius Shepard doesn't do well, then then it's, you know people will be racing to the wire, racing to the waiver wire, or I look stupid. <laughs> Well, I mean, if he does well, then maybe people chalk it up to, oh, you know, no Adams, no Lazard. So if Adams comes back next week, which he should, maybe he still goes a little bit under the wire because people assume it's a one-week thing. So you still sneak under there and grab him. I suppose. Hopefully. Yeah. But, uh, it's, Anyways. It's, it's kind of an odd one because of, because of the game being being played as we speak. But I try to I try to pick spec as that, that are people uh, like... I think we talked about this last week. Is that when you pick over the bones after the after waivers are done? Yeah, that is fun to do. Uh, my <clears> spec <throat> ad for the week is going to be Gabriel Davis, uh, wide receiver for the Bills. Uh, I mean, he's not starting just yet. He's the fourth receiver on the depth chart behind Stephon Diggs, John Brown, Cole Beasley. But the Bills have run a few four wide receiver sets, which not shocking considering how well the offense has moved early in the season. Um, but he is, Davis is definitely reaping the benefits to Josh Allen's, uh, incredible start. It's fourth round pick. He scored a touchdown in two of his last three games. Uh, and he looks like a solid, uh, solid, solid deep threat, averaging 16 yards a target, which is good for second, uh, second in the league behind Justin Jefferson, another one of those young receivers. Yep. Um, if anybody, you know, Beasley, Brown, Diggs, if, and Diggs hasn't exactly been a picture of health <laughs> in his career. If one of those guys gets hurt, I think Davis is a very solid, uh, kind of backup bench stash just to see what happens. Uh, just based purely because Josh Allen's throwing the ball so well. Yeah. And not only that, um, John Brown, uh, was had a calf injury. And so in a way, he's kind of like a, uh, you can stash him for, uh, for the purposes of kind of like uh, a wide receiver cuff in a way so because Josh Allen is going to be passing so if any any receiver goes down um, it doesn't matter from Beasley to, to uh, Brown or or, or or even Diggs so it you know it's kind of good to their offense is conducive to to actually having a guy like Gabriel Davis I agree it's a great pick Great, great spec. Hooray! I'm not, I'm not great. My spec ads have not had a good track record so far this season, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> I like it. Uh, well, that finishes it up for us uh, as we move into the close to the fourth quarter of the uh, Chiefs-Pats game here. Uh, Richard, do you have any final thoughts uh, for the week as uh, week four finishes and week five is about to begin? Uh, yes, I do. Um, if, uh, if there's any COVID problems... Uh, this week be prepared for the league to take drastic action um, because um, I was actually very concerned that uh, they were actually going to shut down week four. I think a lot of people were thinking that. I mean, we were thinking the worst after the Saints. So these things are going to come up. So uh, again, um, just stay strong. We're moving forward and uh, good luck in week five. Just keep keep thinking positive. Nah, no better way to end the show than that. Keep thinking positive. Uh, again, everybody, thank you for listening. Um, Jonathan Chan that, uh, with Richard Seville, as always. Uh, Kevin will probably be back next week and uh, we'll see. We'll talk to you all then. Thanks for listening.